important. Well, a very warm welcome. And uh, wherever you are in the world, thank you very much indeed for coming to our 16th Thought Leadership Webinar. And uh, this week, uh, the topic is planning for the new normal, positioning security teams to contribute strategic value. And these words, new normal and strategic value, have cropped up continually in our uh, webinars so far. And so it seemed rather logical that we would have a webinar specifically on it. Now in front of, a, you, in front of you, you can see on your screen now, a pretty picture of all your panelists which is just as well because we can't get Liz Allen's camera working uh, um, and so uh, you're just going to hear his name. So at least you can um, uh, know who everyone is. Uh, I'm very grateful today for Critical Art for uh, um, supporting this particular webinar. Um, they showed a particular interest in this issue of strategic value and thinking differently. Uh, and that's the idea of thought leadership, that by critiquing and thinking differently about what, what's going on today, we have a better type of security tomorrow. So how it's going to work is I'm going to ask each of our panellists just to do a very brief introduction to who they are and once they've done that I will then ask each of them for an opening statement and uh, once they've made their opening statement I'll come to you the audience around the world for your questions so please do get them ready don't forget it's not the chat button to ask question it's the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So let's introduce our panellists first of all from the United States Dan. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good day and good evening to the guests. Uh, my name is Dan Savageo. I'm currently a faculty member with the Security Executive mm -hmm. Council. So a little change to uh, what you see there. Uh, I was with Fidelity Investments for 29 years. I retired out uh, last spring. And prior to that, I was in the defense industry of looking after security programs there as well. I am a, a CPP with uh, ASIS, as past CBCP with Disaster Recovery Institute. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Les, we haven't got a picture of you, but perhaps you could introduce yourself, Les, from Scotland. Good day, everybody. I'm, I'm Les Allen. I'm Director of Safeguarding Services with Harry Watt University in the UK. And I'm also the current Vice Chairman of the Association of University Chief Security Officers. Background wise, I've got around 41 years experience, both police, security and safety industries um, behind me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Les. And from Scotland, we go to Ireland and Esther. Hi, I'm Esther Hoban. I'm a company director for the last 20 years. Um, at the moment, one of my clients is Trinity College Dublin and I'm program manager there, which is of interest in the, this session. Thank you very much indeed. And from Ireland back to the United States and Glenn. Hi everyone, Glenn Ferrant, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Critical Arc. Thank you for having us, Martin, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. Okay, so let's go to our opening statements, three minutes for our panelists to give their views on this topic. Let's start with you, Dan. Sure. Uh, so I, I will skip all the adjectives associated with this, the unprecedented, challenging times, whatnot. Uh, but I will say that for years, security has always struggled with how do you prove and demonstrate your value in a corporation? And I think we... We have an opportunity here with this unfortunate pandemic to really demonstrate the value that we have to the corporation because I think unlike other singular crisis events, pick one, 9-11, terrorist attempts, natural disasters, this is affecting the world. This is affecting every company. I think every company, CEO, HR manager, director, they all had to become crisis managers. Um, some are going to do well at that. Some are not going to do well. But I think what security has the advantage of is we've got a, a plethora of experienced, talented teams, backgrounds that really afford us the opportunity to lead in this crisis. I think also you're going to see, you see now CSOs who are having, successful CSOs having daily conversations with their CEOs, meeting with board members. This was always the point of getting a seat at the table. Well, now the time has come. This is the time to rise up. And I'd say it's, it's not too late if a CSO or leader hasn't been at the table because this is a long tailed event. There's gonna be a lot more to happen in the months uh, ahead in terms of reopening and how do we opening, whether or not we have second waves or third waves or flare outs. Um, I'll also say this is an opportunity for uh, progressive security departments to showcase the technology they have because I think this is gonna be a security 2.0 opportunity. Uh, I think this is successful departments are going to be the ones that leverage technology. I'm talking about AI, machine learning, robotics. Uh, when you think back at 9-11, at, at 
right? No industry had the ability to track their travelers, but within 18 months to two years, they could do that. Technology will move very quickly. And you think about how we would be managing this pandemic 20 years ago when the smartphone didn't exist, cloud computing was limited. We didn't have Zoom videos to do these things. Successful CSOs and security organizations are, are gonna be the ones that are creative, innovative, and leverage technology because it's gonna be a need and the bottom lines of companies are gonna require that every dollar is precious and those dollars be used effectively. And I'll talk more about that as we get into the program. Thank you very much indeed. Let me now go to Les. Les, we haven't got a picture of you, but we've got your voice. That may be a blessing in disguise. <laughs> Firstly, I, I really feel that we shouldn't expect our operations or budgets to ever look the same as it did prior to this pandemic. Certainly in my view, all of our employers, regardless of whether we're public or private sectors, will undoubtedly need to reevaluate their own finances. And as um, security managers, directors, whatever we have within our own industries, we'll all need to reassess how we will cope with a change in operations and the budgets we have available to us. I really feel that we can't afford to rest on our own laurels from past successes, and we shouldn't assume that changes won't impact on our services. We should keep in mind that we are now very likely to be in a competing market within our own organisation to tap into what funding is available and taking account of what Dan just said about the likelihood of budgets being significantly curtailed as we go ahead. You need to make sure that your own service adapts to the new order we have, bringing in new and added value to your organization. That may well mean restructuring how you operate, but possibly more importantly, how you can collaborate with other departments and create strategic alliances for joint processes. Try taking a step outside your own leadership chain and look at your service through the eyes of others. What do you see? Does it do the same as it did two or even 10 years ago? If so, you may not be well positioned. Is it currently or can it be adapted into a dynamic service that is higher profile within your organization? Particularly look at it as don't be a prohibitor, be an enabler. What can you now do differently to support your organization going ahead? Remembering that your ability to adapt and contribute may well influence how you will not only secure capital funding for new projects and development in your service, but it may also be a dependency in holding on to the budget you already currently have. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll go from Scotland again over to Ireland. Esther. Yeah, we in Trinity have faced everything the, the same as what everybody else is facing. We reckon that we've, um, we probably will lose in the region of 300 million. We have a summer series of top artist concerts which has been cancelled. It's the largest Christian artifact uh, in the world. Well, the oldest Christian artifact in the world. So we've lost tourism with that. In the summertime in Dublin, we um, turn into the largest hotel in Ireland and that's obviously gone. So we are facing exactly the same financial implications that everybody else is. Um, as a program manager, it's very evident to me through our capital review group meetings, which we have every month. And we had 45 projects presented for approval and two got passed. Um, the two that did get passed are technology that will enable uh, the success, successful handling of COVID. And just to go into some of the specifics of what we have been dealing with, uh, we're like locked down with everything, but in student terms, that meant an opportunity to go on the RAS so, and to spread COVID in the process. So we had very early uh, stages of COVID who were walking around with college to keep putting our security and our maintenance staff at risk. Um, we weren't sure of how to secure them and the security staff. So we've introduced technology to do that. We introduced it over a weekend, got funding, procurement, legal, um, board. And within two days, the data commissioner of Ireland was onto us checking GDPR. Um, and now we've got a new challenge as to how we can reintroduce people. So say, for instance, we've got 400 seater theater, which can only hold 50 students due to social distancing. Uh, we obviously have the financial implications of that with the academic implications of it. So there's a huge um, exercise that's done. It, and it's, it's not, it, it is absolutely thinking outside the box and involving every other um, department in the university. Like our steering committee has gone from 
five members to 25 members because of the uh, how far it encompasses everybody. So I think in a way it can be an opportunity to liaise with other departments and definitely to think outside the box as to how security can add value. And we, we are seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis with the, the comments and the feedback that is coming into them and what a great job they're doing. So um, I would encourage that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Esther. And finally, uh, back to the United States and Glenn. Thanks, Martin. Well, we're engaged with hundreds of organisations across thousands of locations across the globe. So we're seeing this from both regional and the impacts in different sectors. And, you know, as Dan said, he wasn't going to mention some of the adjectives, but he did. It's unprecedented and people do not really know what to expect. There's a lot of uncertainty. But the one thing that is very common right at the moment is that every organisation is talking about getting back to business. And getting back to business is absolutely critical. We heard from Esther there where um, Trinity College is, is talking about losses of you know, potentially hundreds of millions of, of euro. So uh, being engaged in the business is absolutely critical. And if I was to make a criticism of us as security practitioners, um, on the positive side, we're very operational. We're very focused on getting the job done. We're very service oriented. But as a generalization, we're not so engaged in the business side. We don't talk the same language as the CFO necessarily or the CEO or the COO. And here is the opportunity to engage. Now, the great thing, as Dan mentioned, is the security teams are central at the moment. In a lot of cases, the security team is the main resource on site. As, as Esther and, as Le and Les mentioned, we are at, at the table and maybe centrally at the table about dealing with the situation on site right at the moment. So we have the ear of everybody and that's the time to make those alliances and relationships stronger across the organization. So we've got the boots on the ground, we've got the systems, we've got the potential solutions and everyone from the CEO down, again, doesn't really know exactly how this will play out and what to do, but there is comfort in action. And if, if anything, us in the security area have the ability to act and deal with this situation. So we can be providing that comfort to the rest of the organization. Now, with regards to being able to operationalize things and act, what we're seeing across the industry is tighter relationships, especially with IT departments. As, as Dan mentioned, and Esther mentioned, technology is a significant, there's a significant opportunity with technology here. And we're seeing the IT departments being central about solving business problems because that's what they do day in, day out. And they've got a big business problem to solve, but they don't have necessarily the oper operational nows to deal with it. So we're seeing alliances between security and facilities and the IT departments to deal with this. Things like monitoring space, occupancy levels, uh, contact tracing, managing the safety of people working alone, opening and closing campuses and buildings. It's a, it's a joint solution that's going to take IT as well. So I'd really uh, ask everyone to engage with the IT teams. Now, as I mentioned, action is comforting. Perception is everything. As we get back to business as usual, we need to be seen and acting to make the area safe. You're going to have staff, potentially students, whoever, coming back to your environments. They're going to want to see that there are solutions in place that help keep them safe and security are going to be the face of that. So you, you're, we're right in the middle of it all. Budgets, budgets are going to be cut everywhere. Uh, to, to Esther's point, what we are seeing though, is those projects which can help, getting back, help get back to business, they're getting funded and they're getting driven. We're seeing millions of dollars, euros and pounds spent on technology to get back to, um, get back to business. And, and that's, the, that's the key thing. As we go through with the planning, uh, we are going to have to walk a fine line. We're going to have to walk a fine line with meeting recommendations, following best practices, seeing what competitors are doing. If competitors are getting back to work quicker than we are, then we're, our business is going to be at a disadvantage. So we need to be walking that fine line. And finally, the moral and ethical um, line as well. Keep, you know, keeping people safe is what we do, and we want to maintain that. So we're being called on to do more than ever. We're right at the center of things, but now's the time to lead and there is a real opportunity here. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed then. Well, um, let me uh, get to the questions straight away then. And just to remind everybody, if you've got a question to ask, 
uh, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And if you do this sooner rather than later, we'll try and incorporate it into the discussion. Let me come to you first, Dan. And um, interesting points there about opportunity. But um, um, it was said also uh, um, by panelists that um, security hasn't traditionally spoken the language of business. It hasn't been at the C-suite level. Um, not the sort of credentials that you would consider ideal for wanting to protect and speak up for a, a whole department or sector or industry. Uh, we can say nice things around this table because we're all pro-security, but um, if you're independent of this, it doesn't look good, does it? No, um, I, I think if for, for the security departments and leaders that are living in their silos, they will have short careers in their companies. Uh, they will have reduced budgets or budgets at all. Uh, you know, Glenn hit on a very important point. It's about relationships. If you don't have strong collaborative relationships internal with your facilities, HR, legal, health and safety, uh, and externally, law enforcement, I would add externally public health agencies more than ever. Uh, if you don't have those relationships, because at the end of the day, the CEOs and the boards, right? These, this is board level attention. Prior to this crisis, the only issues that really have received a lot of board level attention has been IT breaches, right? And all the money and resources would go in towards them. Workplace violence occasionally. Um, but boards are gonna have an interest in there and they're gonna wanna see who stood and delivered, who was able to, to work as a team collaboratively, creatively and effectively get the mission done. Um, Anyone who is in a silo will be left behind uh, in budgets and career. Uh, this is not a time for that. Thank you. I mean, uh, um, Les, uh, your peer group. I mean, this is a question Nigel Carpenter posed, which uh, some of you mentioned about, you know, economic times are going to get tough. And uh, there's a suggestion that uh, security is one of the first to um, uh, come under the uh, spotlight when that happens. Um, and some of you mentioned that as well. But, but, um, in a previous webinar, one of the panelists um, made the point that um, just as that happens, companies are going to think differently and therein rests the opportunity when companies are thinking differently. It comes up to the skill set of security to position itself. Um, how much do you think that is an opportunity given where security is? Not on the basis of what it's done, Les, because I, I can see how people are saying very good things about it, but in terms of its ability to harness the opportunity here. There's your thoughts. I think really what, um, certainly from my, my own sector's point of view, is that you need to move with the time. You need to become innovative. You have to think of new solutions and ways that you can add into value. Glenn alluded very much to the use of technology, and in our sector, that's very much the way to go. Any of us, um, as Dan commented, that are stuck in the, the old traditions and are only seen as a service that checks door handles and windows are closed at night, is, is absolutely doomed. We have to embrace technology and not just embrace it, but lead on it to make sure that our employer sees us as a valued service that's critical and strategic to its operations and not just an add-on that can be discarded or chopped around a bit and whatnot. Um, look for alliances as well. It's often a good one where you can maybe look at your security service merging with other services. Dan mentioned health and safety. Um, you could take that on board, emergency planning, which are often small autonomous departments in their own right, but you can begin to build more super departments by merging with these smaller ones, it brings your budget in with them as well, and it gives you far more strategic clout with your own board to put forward your own ideas for financing projects and to increase budget rather than lose it. Uh, um, thank you very much indeed, Les. I'm gonna ask a question to Esther now from Mark Rowe. Who's, um, who's asked the question about whether, I mean, it's a good question of this, about the use of technology. And I mean, are people gonna to have to pass through some sort of checkpoint to enter lecture theater uh, over there in Ireland? Uh, um, um, how far is this uh, technology actually going to be able to influence practice? And to what extent, in your case, Esther, is security involved in these discussions? Yeah, well, we've taken a very practical view of it. And just um, adding on from, uh, Les's comments there. We always know that it's a success if I've got a, a battle for a sponsor of the steering committee and that's what's happening at the moment because it's seen to be such a critical uh, solution that we're implementing. So we're allowing all of it where we're demanding that all of our users check in. We're also demanding that they would provide us with our health status. 
we have a device there that would um, allow them to help other students and staff who are incapacitated due to COVID or for other reasons, like if they're a vulnerable group. Um, and then it also allows them to trigger alerts. So that's on a, on a practical level at the moment. And, and it, is, it is working well for us. Going forward, it's not going to be as useful because it doesn't, um, it doesn't like stop people going into lecture theatres, but it does stop people coming on site. So we have closed, like we're a city centre campus in the, on the most part, and we have closed all of our gates except two. Now, because we're over 400 years old, we have doors that open from the outside of the streets and underway passages and things like that. So people are getting in who consider themselves to be essential, but they're not essential, but they are still coming on board. But on the whole, security have been really involved with this because it is their function to um, check that people are logged into the technology so that they are there and that their health status has been confirmed. It's, it's very much an opt-in on the health status because of GDPR. And like I say, we did have the data commissioner um, onto us on day two. Um, and, and we are covered, but I'm not quite sure we would be covered to the same extent if it wasn't during COVID. Um, but security have, have definitely been involved. And our next step now is trying to get people to complete some sort of a questionnaire where they self-declare before they come on site. And again, that will be the responsibility of security to ensure that that functionality has been completed and that they are checked into the app before they come on board. But then after that, you know, like we can tell them how many people can physically fit into a lecture theatre given social distancing, but, and we will be monitoring it, but we've got a reduced capacity of staff as well. So we're not going to catch every instance and we don't have access going in at the moment, no. Esther, thank you very much indeed for that. Let me come to Glenn next. Glenn, uh, it sounds like it looks like you want to build on that, but generally just come to yeah. you from a question of Victoria at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you'll be able to build them in together, actually. Okay. Who, by the way, okay. likes your opening statement, uh, uh, Glenn, mm -hmm. you'll be pleased to know. And she asked a, a really good question, which builds directly on Esther's point, which is um, what do security operations managers need to do differently to support an organisational comeback? And I wonder whether we can get a bit more to this point about what needs to happen uh, in a more precise way. Glenn, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think Esther um, hit on a really important topic there is that um, from an operational perspective, the presence and availability of your team as they're spread out across your area of responsibility and their ability to manage the situations is going to be quite important. So from an operational perspective, as Esther mentioned, what do you do, for example, if you get an indication that there is excess occupancy in a particular area? How do you take your limited staff? We're like, we've already mentioned we're like, unlikely to get more budget. We may have less budget. So how do you handle your resources in the most effective way? So what we see as best practice there is being able to understand the disposition of your team members ensure that they have a view of what's happening around them and they're empowered to be able to make decisions, to be able to respond to situations. Whether it's a route, what will become a routine situation, like managing occupancy in an area, or even whilst they're busy doing that, still responding to various areas. So this concept of managing the situation collaboratively across a team, allowing you to do effectively more with the same resources through this distributed situational awareness, using technology to solve that. I think that's a, that's a key thing. Training's going to be very important. You're going to need to have all of your security team members trained up to a level where they can use this technology. So there's going to be effort required to get into get, uh, you know, these new measures and these new procedures and policies into place. Now they've got to be practical and they've got to be simple, but there are uh, some you know, quite powerful technologies that allow teams to coordinate themselves to be able to be as effective as possible. And then being able to review and learn from it. So having a continuous improvement type approach, being able to look at historical information, be able to understand physical presence and response capability, and then being able to make uh, changes to the way you're <laughs> operating across a site. I think that the information and the data is available now and teams can uh, take advantage of that. To, just to stepping on to Esther's point, I think there's one Very question briefly, about... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, about behaviour. We're going in phases here, and it's and it's compliance of people with these new new initiatives. At the moment, we're getting great compliance. We've got people coming back to site, and they're the essential people, and they know that it's critical that they come back to site. So they may may be prepared to share their location or sharing personal information about themselves. When we get the bulk of people back, who knows what's going to happen? The population is compliant at the moment, but what is going to happen over the long time long term? And we need to have practical procedures for that eventuality as well. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I think you've been looking at our notes here in, uh, 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 <laughs> in organising webinars. We've got one uh, just organised, that's going to announce at the end on training and another one about uh, crisis. So um, uh, thank you for that. Let me come to uh, Dan. And I want to build on something that's been said already, Dan. And Raymond Ubaji from Nigeria, um, who's uh, involved uh, in the security world out there. And uh, nice to have you, Raymond. Uh, makes the point that um, there's the opportunity here for security to expand into other areas. You were making the point about collaboration. Um, you know, he mentioned occupational self and health and safety. Um, uh, Glenn mentioned IT. Uh, crisis management had come up. Um, um, he's mentioned business continuity. Uh, Raymond's mentioned business continuity himself. The question here is, though, Dan, is there a danger? All these are going to prove more important than security, and that uh, there's an argument for Kate saying almost the opposite here. That, that these are crisis management is more important and that's going to be uh, central. Health and safety is more important, that's going to be central. IT is going to be important, for what all of you said in different ways, that's going to be more central. Security is going to be uh, right on the margins. That's the reality here. Dan, just your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, I, th I think what's central to this crisis and many crises is people, right? And security practitioners usually have a pretty good understanding of psychology and sociology and how we work with people. And that is always going to be, when you think about people are our greatest assets and they're also one of our greatest risks. When you think about insider risk or, or non-compliance or violating the rules. So I think where, you know, HR and security really have a good understanding of how people think and behave. And it's those behaviors that are going to make the success of a company. It's going to be the behaviors that either strengthen the company brand or damage the company brand. Uh, you know, with comments about working with other departments, absolutely essential. I think it's seen as, and I think CEOs at the top aren't going to be rewarding individual groups. They're going to want to see a team effort because this crisis is too big to have silos or, or people looking for the accolades for their one person or their one team. I think security is going to can, can be that that glue and that force multiplier for an organization mm. to help protect the brand the people and their customer assets thank you um uh, interesting answer thank you for that uh, uh, dan let me come to um uh, you uh, les stuart nesbitt asked a question about um uh, building on similar lines here okay that there is a tendency for us to say um it's all good for security and he asked the question um, um, is there a danger security is seen as a necessary evil to meet insurance requirements or is this pandemic really going to change the perception of security as, as a key player? Um, uh, uh, there's your thoughts. Again, I think it's a golden opportunity um, to change how we operate completely. Certainly within the higher education sector in the UK, the very term security is beginning to be a bit old hat. Um, just as an example, what I did with my own service four years ago, I merged several services together and dropped the name security and called it safeguarding. We upskilled all our officers to provide a, an across-the-boards service that, that manage well-being as well as traditional security, improves their communication skills. We merged with health and safety and with emergency planning, and we've dropped the term emergency planning as well, mainly because... Um, at an academic level, they don't like the term emergency. It may well be an emergency, it's just skinning the rabbit a different way, calling it something else um, to get out there. So I, I really think there are golden opportunities to review what your service does, merge with other services, build collaborations, for instance, in the higher education sector, to build collaborations with your student welfare departments and particularly with your estates department, so that you're providing an across the board service that's collaborative and inclusive to make sure that you're not seen as a silo standalone service that's sitting quietly in the background. One other thing I would say is I really feel that communications are key to success. Speak to your marketing people. They're sitting twiddling their thumbs just now looking for good news stories. Get them involved to raise your own service profile. Write articles. 
do profiles on individuals within it to give them a human factor face so you're not an autonomous security service standing away in the background or hanging about in the dark. Use social media, get your own people out there speaking to your working community, improve your service visibility, um, get your market materials, social media, all that type of thing right out there to keep adding value to your own service and add value to your, your employer to make sure you can tap into whatever finance is going to be available in the future. Okay, thank you very much. We're getting quite a few questions on uh, uh, on technology. Uh, um, I'll come to you next, Esther. In fact, one of the questions is asking you precisely uh, what the uh, um, key investment in technology is going to be in your case, Esther. But you might want to address that before you do. Mohammed Omar says, um, "Do you see uh, do you see more technology being integrated in the airports? Do you see companies giving extra roles to HR to reduce the security budget?" Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Gerard Lorraine asks about the sorts of technology you're going to be invested in and uh, uh, Mike McBride on technology says in a post-COVID-19 world what are the panelists thoughts on the contactless or touch-free technology for access control is this an opportunity to security show they're looking ahead and of course gets around various health and safety concerns uh, we've got a lot of questions so I'm going to put those your way Esther first and take that what of you will please and give us your thoughts on technology briefly if you could please yeah, well, like I say, the only two projects that got approved were technology-based. We implemented that technology solution I was talking about over a weekend, which um, I haven't been at a user conference just previously to it, and I heard, oh, it takes like a, a small amount of time to implement. I was like, yeah, that wouldn't happen in Trinity. But when push comes to shove, everybody's shoulder was to the wheel, and we did get it over the line in uh, a weekend. Um, since then, people are like, it's just like how long is a piece of string? So. You give them this and now they're saying and i wonder could it uh, deliver x y and z on top of that so everybody is now looking for because i suppose the academic way of teaching has gone completely online everybody is thinking outside of the box and looking for existing technologies as opposed to well in our case anyway as opposed to investing in new technologies they're looking to existing technologies to deliver more through customization or configuration um, we ourselves can't put, we, we have a restriction on access control because a lot of our buildings are listed. So we have to go through a rigorous planning permission um, to get anything like that in. So that really isn't an option for us. So what we are trying to do is do more with what we have at less cost. Okay, um, let me come to you now, Glenn. I mean, I'm sure you, you, you'd love to talk about technology. Uh, Glenn Kitteringham, Dr. Glenn Kitteringham, was on a previous panel at this actually, asked an interesting question. Uh, um, his point is, okay, so we're, we're, we're implementing these safety measures and on these webinars and many money out of the platforms, people are talking about the good things they do. His question is, is there any proof they work? I mean, is there a science behind how, where security is going here? And perhaps more on the integration of new technologies and people. Um, it feels good, it sounds good, but where's the evaluation and how do we know? Uh, um, Glenn, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, great question, Glenn, thank you. Uh, there, there are a couple of levels to this. I guess in, in some respects, there's measurement of things like sentiment and you, you can understand the um, the perspective of your constituents uh, as a result of implementation of security technology, for example. So surveys can be taken and you can get the, the, the idea from, from your populace. And that, that is happening. So uh, now we've talked a lot about universities here, but we've heard from, for example, um, Teesside uh, University up in the north of England, uh, they have uh, both done uh, these surveys and they've also, those surveys have also been reflected in rankings of the organisation competitively. And that's been as a result of initiatives that are underpinned by technology, but are very human in nature, that are uh, focused on making people safe. So that's a, that's a soft answer. It's about people's perceptions, but you know, perceptions are reality. So the, the surveying of you know, individuals and understanding their sentiment is important. I think the other angle that we see, we, we heard Dan talk about machine learning and AI and understanding data. Uh, with these systems these days that are coming into being, like ours, where we're understanding where people are from minute to minute and being able to coordinate response, we've got a lot of data now. We can look at the effectiveness, the actual operational effectiveness of a team before and after. 
how much area they're covering, what their response times are, how they dealt with a particular situation. So we're mining that data to understand what best practices are. And we feed that back to our, you know, our customer organization so they understand where they are as a benchmark. So there's hard data about operations and then also the, you know, the sentiment side about what technology can underpin. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to come to you, Dan, on this, this question about proving value and does it work? I mean, of course, this has been an area that has, um, the security world has engaged with, perhaps uh, not as wholeheartedly as other, other professions or sectors have done so. Um, and it will be interesting to see the process by which security as a sector, as an industry, says, look what we're doing, look how successful we've been. It seems to me all a bit anecdotal. And um, uh, um, I wonder whether there'll be a serious move to move from that in the way that clearly Glenn's right can be done, whether it's a sector that's gonna come through at the end so it can present itself as, look what difference we've made as a group. Dan, your thoughts? I think it will. And I think it's important that companies, I think it's always been important, even more so now that they develop a set of metrics that really help demonstrate the value of the security team. When I was CSO, I would have a one page document that had our value proposition, very simple to read. And I would meet with every executive that came into the country with company within three months. And I explained to him what our, him or her, what our security department did. And invariably they come across and say, I didn't realize that you did travel security, internal investigations, background vetting, whatever, you know, business continuity. And, and they remembered those things. So when time of crisis came, I said, I, I met with Dan, I know what they did. Um, I think, but, but behind that, you have metrics for each of the programs that show that. And when we talk about technology here, you know, we, it's always the question that comes up is what's the ROI? What's your return on investment if I'm gonna give you this capital money? That question is gonna be looming bigger and bigger and you're gonna need metrics behind those requests for capital investments. Um, the, the, the work, and I think it's exciting work. I think that we have the attention of the CEOs and the boards. It's how we use it. And I think now is the time to be developing the story. What, what is the story of security and the value that they can bring? And you've got to really precisely hammer that home and, and really get it down to your elevator speech and, and then constantly evolve it. It's not something you just sit and say, hey, it's done. This is an evolutionary process. Thank you. I'm going to come to both um, uh, Les and Esther for a comment on Johan uh, uh, about, about this point about metrics, really. And uh, um, uh, are you using metrics? And uh, um, how do you see you can be judged in harsh terms? Or, or don't you think that would be necessary? A brief comment, please, from Les and from Esther. Les first. Right, I'll go first. We use a lot of electronic systems, uh, various types, CCTV, um, response type software, access control, and we manage all of our business in a paperless environment using a cloud-based management system. That really gives us a good opportunity to look at metrics within that, look at response times, where a resource um, deployment should go, that type of thing. Um, we, we are now sitting in a situation, we introduced this system about four years ago, and we've got nearly 50,000 incidents within the system that we can analyze the data, and that helps us to decide how to deploy resources. Let's us test our own resilience as well, and it enables us to analyze how good we are at response, times in it, how we manage incidents, and it gives us a good search facility um, to look back and review what we do to enable us, enable us to judge how we can improve. Thank you, and Esther, same question to you. Yeah. We're, we're pretty much the same across the board. We analyze all of our metrics um, on different systems. I think where we probably could improve is that we could marry some of them analytics together to give a more judgmental um, overview, if you like. So at the moment, you, you sort of isolate incidents in isolation or you identify them in isolation as opposed to you know, how many staff we had on at, at, like, at the premises at the time and how many incidents. So if we could say amalgamate metrics from different systems with each other, I think that would be far more meaningful, but we don't do that as well as we could. Yeah, okay, opportunity there then. Glenn, mm. uh, Johan de Witt from the Netherlands has got a question uh, and he says, uh, um, he's talking about the investments needed to get back in business uh, and when they're approved. Do you see the investments as temporary or will the investments to get back in business now be permanent and will stay in place? Fundamental question, I guess. Your thoughts, Greg? Yeah, yeah, it is a fundamental question. And I think there's, um, 
the justification for moving on some on some of these initiatives right now are getting back to business. But in all cases we've been involved with and what we've seen, there's always this longer longer term value that is being discussed. So how does a piece of technology help you get back to business? That's great. That might get support, but if that technology can be leveraged into the future, then it will get support. So I'll take, take an example outside of what we, what we deliver, for example. We're experiencing a lot of organisations really extending their networking and Wi-Fi and indoor positioning technology. And this is something that the IT department's been wanting for a long time, but they've never quite had the business case for it. They've talked about how this can be a strategic value for the organisation, but now they've got the added you know, need to do it right now. So they're, they're using the, the initiative right now, but they're also talking about long-term strategic value. And I believe in every situation we've encountered, there's always that, yeah, this is not something we're going to throw away after we've used it to get back to business. This is something that's going to be utilized and ingrained in our processes going forward. And that's, that's absolutely important. No one wants to waste money, especially at the moment. And uh, that's a requirement. Yeah, I mean, same question to you, Dan. Do you see the investment um, um, temporary or do you or are you more hopeful I think you're gonna see it evolve and if you think back of what happened on 9-11 and you know airport screening just came out you had a very clunky system that threw a lot of people at it and then it evolved and the technology caught up with that so you have a little bit more streamlined input I think you're gonna see you know technology solutions come into whatever it takes to open the business and get the doors open and then you're going to see this refinement quickly being pushed and say, how do we, how do we leverage the technologies? And there's going to be some that say, hey, this we tried this and it didn't work. Because you know, the question earlier was, you know, uh, this frictionless access control and borders. We were already going down that path. This is just going to accelerate that. I think the need and desire is still going to be, what's the employee experience and the customer experience? That's not going to go away. But security, give me security with the convenience and the efficiency that comes with it. And that's gonna be the challenge. And I think it's gonna require, Martin, we talk about things, one thing we didn't talk about is different sets of thinking. Who we recruit and, rec and hire in security departments needs to be different in the future. I'm a criminal justice background person, but I think we need to think about diversity of talent and, and thought, business-minded people, data scientists, people, people understand applications and develop that because you're gonna need a lot of different uh, skill sets than traditional security skill sets to manage this security 2.0 in the future. Um, Dan, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to, uh, we've got some very good questions from uh, um, other, other uh, um, members of the audience. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, um, always a good, good sign when there's more questions and uh, um, you, you need more time. We will pick up on these though in the webinars next week. But let me just um, now come to each of my panelists and I'm going to ask them just for a final set of comments. Uh, um, 20 seconds each, please. Uh, we're getting near the end. Uh, Les, your, yours first. Just a, a summary, summary comment. Just quickly, I'm certainly anticipating budget cuts and I think to be prepared in advance takes you to the forefront. Look to see what you could do without or do with less of and look at sacrificing that to obtain what you still want to retain and gain for going ahead. Thank you, Les. Uh, I'll come to you next, Dan, because uh, um, as is just coughing and uh, as he's caught a breath. Uh, Dan, your final comments, please. Yes. Um, use your investment dollars wisely. Don't buy single use systems. Um, buy systems and solutions that are going to integrate with human resources and facilities and other things. Uh, be relevant in your organization, build and strengthen those internal partnerships and external partnerships, and think about the talent base you're going to need for the next five years. Diversify that talent base and experience to build your team for future success. Great advice, Dan. Thank you. Esther? Yeah, pretty much um, what Les and Dan have said, um, like your budgets will be cut. So try to piggyback on other people's budgets uh, to go in with combined proposals. Um, that's worked fairly well for us. Um, the use of technology has definitely been a really good and positive driver for us. Um, one thing I would say has probably been a bit of a downfall is our communications. Whereas we spent a lot, a lot of time trying to be so politically correct with our communications where we probably missed some of the like basic fundamental messaging. So I would, I would um, try to concentrate on that a bit more. Thank you very much, Lisa. So it seems only appropriate, Glenn, to leave the final comment to you. 
Thanks, Martin. Well, I think there's a real opportunity to not be shy in retiring. I think we need to promote the uh, the capability and the impact that security been having. It's a bit going to be about efficiency and effectiveness, but you're also going to be playing a really key role in getting back to business. And that has a lot riding on it. So, and people need to know this. I liked Les's comment about utilizing some of the marketing team, get someone in, get your good news stories out. That will actually be a benefit to the business, but it'll be a benefit to you too. And look for technology to help. Thank you very much indeed. Well, as Marshall Kent said, uh, thank you very much indeed to all the panellists for their insightful views. Uh, uh, really a very, very uh, thought provoking uh, set of issues covered there. Uh, and thank you very much indeed to uh, um, Critical Art for supporting this particular um, uh, uh, webinar. And indeed to our supporters, uh, to uh, AltiABN, to Innovise, to International Security Expo and the Security Event, to all of them. And uh, Critical Art were very good in doing some very nice um, um, uh, uh, images for us as well. Um, now, when we're talking about being good at security and how fundamental it is, can I please encourage you to nominate someone for the Outstanding Security Performance Awards. It matters who's good at security. It matters if people aren't good. So in India, the United States, Benelux, Kenya, Romania, Australia, and the UK, entries are open now. Please do just nominate one entry. Give one person the chance to, uh, one team or one initiative or one company, uh, um, let's find out who's good at doing what they're doing. And just to let you know, we go through it all again on uh, Thursday, um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we're with you. Uh, um, and we're going to be talking about, would you want a career in security now? Uh, what has COVID-19 been doing to the future talent pool? And uh, next week, we've got uh, two, uh, uh, two new uh, webinars. Uh, one is about uh, how valued and how valuable is security. And, uh, um, and, and on Thursday, we're contemplating worst case scenarios. Uh, we're planning more as well, so do stay with us. Uh, so once again, my thanks to the audience around the world for your questions and for your support and your interest. My thanks to Critical Art once again. A very special thank to my panelists for their insightful views and some very nice comments already being made about you all, by the way. And, uh, um, and wherever you are in the world, stay safe.